Hello there! In my most recent tutorial, I talked about white balancing without a gray card. Today, we will look into all the different tools we can use to achieve a perfect white balance, and on top of that, a perfect exposure. Let's get started. Let's start with the oldest one, the classic Kodak R27 18% gray card. I've had these for more than 30 years, and as some of you might know, 18% gray cards are actually not designed for white balance. Back in the days before digital cameras, this was a common tool for exposure. The surface is 18% gray, and that's exactly in the middle between black and white, and designed to work with light meters or cameras with built-in light meters. If we point our camera towards the reflected light from the gray card placed in our scene, we get a very precise exposure. But modern digital cameras with super advanced matrix metering made this method somehow obsolete. By the way, matrix metering is called evaluative metering on a Canon and multi-segment on a Sony. But I still call it matrix because Nikon invented this system back in the 80s Matrix metering makes great results in almost any case, but there are still situations where a gray card is a better choice. Here I have my camera set up in aperture mode and set to matrix metering. Then I place myself on this white background in this white t-shirt and my face looks pretty dark. Well, the whole scene looks underexposed. This is exactly what often happens in snowy conditions where the normally clever matrix metering think it's an overexposed scene and compensates for that. We have the opposite problem on black backgrounds. Now my face is just too overexposed and what should have been black is now washed out gray. Look at the histograms. The spikes are almost identical in the two images. And if we focus on the shutter speed, we can see how much it's changing to maintain what the camera think is a correct exposure. In both cases, if we had used a spot metering on a gray card placed centered in our scene, we could have avoided these miscalculations. Well, even though Kodak gray card aren't designed for white balance, they still provide a pretty precise white balance. Look at this fine horizontal curve that show how the gray is rendered throughout the visual spectrum, I wouldn't hesitate using one, especially after I have used it for a perfect exposure first. Time to look into the different workflows when using a gray card. When working on raw images, it doesn't matter whether we make the white balance in the camera, the exact process depends on the camera brand, or we make it in the raw converter afterwards. In Adobe Camera Raw, we simply click on the card with our white balance tool and the white balance is fixed. If we have a whole series of images we want to balance, we can select them all and synchronize directly in the converter. Or we can do it in Bridge, where we only need one processed image to process them all. We simply right click, that's control click on a Mac, and choose develop settings, copy settings, and then paste the settings on the rest of the images. If we shoot JPEGs or video, it's a totally different ballgame. Here it's crucial to nail exposure and white balance in the recording, because strong adjustments can crush the image. So here we would always balance directly in the camera for the best starting point. Next tool, and slightly more sophisticated, is the Elastolite Expo Balance. It's divided into a middle gray, a black, and a white area. And as the name Expo on Balance indicates, it's designed for both white balance and exposure. If we use it as intended, we would first use it to set the right exposure. The gray peak should be exactly in the middle of our camera's histogram, like that. Or we could use a close metering on the gray surface. Then we open our photo in Photoshop, where we can use it with a curves or levels adjustment layer. Let's use levels, then it's easier to see what's going on. 
Here we have eyedroppers to balance black, white, and gray. If we start with gray, not much happens because we made such a good white balance in the camera. But on this not pre-balanced image, it's pretty okay. Now back to our image and use the black and the white eyedropper as intended. Black and white and much too contrast the image with crushed blacks and blown out highlights. The histogram luckily reveals it all and if we zoom in, we can see how many details we lose in the hair. A better choice is just to use the gray eyedropper and cut where the information in the histogram begins. That's because the black isn't that black, and ironically the white rim here is more white than the white feel here we are supposed to adjust from. So my verdict, it's a pretty cheap tool, and the gray is actually a bit cooler than the Kodak gray card. So I don't trust it that much, by the way, all the precise specifications for the Kodak R27 is available in a PDF and I link to it in my description below. The next tool I'm almost tempted to call a gadget is the Expo Disc. This tool you simply attach to your lens like a lens cap. It has a diameter of 82 mm, big enough to cover most standard lenses, and if it don't fit, you can simply hold it in front of your camera while calibrating. It works by diffusing what's in front of the camera and you use it like a light meter with a diffusion sphere. That means you have to aim it at your light sources. It measures incident light, not reflected light. Which again means this tool is not affected by me wearing a black or a white shirt. Furthermore, the Expo Disc is color balanced, so it works for white balance as well. I use it mostly for video, where all my settings are done before shooting. Only downside is we don't get any great reference in the image to check exposure and white balance in post, but done correctly, this is not a real issue. The next option for white balancing is by far the most advanced. It's not just a white balance tool, it's a calibration tool with a lot of options, the amazing x rite color checker. If we just want to white balance, we have this gray side, much brighter than a regular gray card, but calibrated for a perfect white balance. The reason why we don't use pure white for white balance is that it so easily becomes overexposed, with a risk of losing any differences in the RGB values the distance to the 255 max values is simply too short. Look at this histogram from the Tricolor Expo Balance. The white in the red channel is actually blown out and cannot be used for neutralizing colors. As you already know, when white balancing, we shift the overall color temperature between yellow and blue and green and magenta. But what if only one or two of the colors need to be shifted? We can't do that with a regular white balance card, but as I said before, the color checker is a calibration tool, and when you buy it, you get a piece of software that calibrates all these small patches to how they are supposed to look, and that's a pretty big deal. All cameras render colors a little bit different, but with this tool, you can actually profile them for the same color output. You simply take a shot for each camera, and generate camera specific profiles or profiles for a specific light and camera setup. By the way, be careful never to touch the surface of these small color patches. The finger grease will darken the colors and destroy this very precise calibration tool. But before I demonstrate how to use it, I have to mention that the color checker comes in a video version 2 and the primary colors here are a little bit different because they match the color boxes in the Lumetri scopes in most video editing applications. There are no special software with this video version because you don't work with ICC profiles in video editing, but you can use it to create lots. Well, back to Photoshop. We start by taking a photo of the color checker in the desired environment and open it in the RAW converter, then we output this image 
as a D and G and let's save it in the same location. Now we open the color checker software and drop the D and G we just created. The software auto detects the color checker as you can see on these green squares. It's possible to adjust manually if the detection fails. Luckily, everything is okay. So let's just press create profile. The software recognized the camera I used in this case. So let's stick to this name. Now the profile is ready and we can find it if we browse under the profile tab in the raw converter. And this is our new profile before and after. We can also use the second from the right to white balance if we didn't do that in advance. Now we have very precise colors. If we use two different cameras, we can make them look close to similar. Here we have images from a Fuji and a Canon stacked as layers in a Photoshop document. They are not perfectly aligned, but maybe it's okay so one can see I'm jumping between the layers. The top layer is the Fuji with just the standard profile and next is the Canon with the same profile. I have taken the most saturated items I could find so it's easier to see any shifting in colors. Canon, Fuji, Canon. Definitely some heavy shifting in some of the colors. I hope you can see that on your screen as well. Let's turn off the two top layers and see the shots calibrated with the color checker. This is the Fuji and this is the Canon. Fuji, Canon, much more similar colors. Now we have looked into a few options for a perfect white balance. But as I said in my most recent tutorial, White Balance Part 1, it's not always necessary to use a gray card. Sometimes it can actually ruin your photos. If you haven't seen Part 1, there's a link in the description below and on the end card. Right now I'm working on a tutorial not just about color correction, but color management. The art of maintaining color appearance from capture to print. So please ring that bell if you want to be notified. Or you could of course continue watching my white balance part one. Thank you and goodbye.